Hello and welcome to my lecture for week four. This unit is entitled Yankees and Witches and uh, I think it's pretty interesting. You'll notice that there are quite a few additional readings and some videos to watch and I would recommend uh, your checking those out. I think you'll find that that's probably some of the more interesting aspects of uh, what we've looked at in this first unit. Um, and I typically get sidetracked on the Salem Witch Trials for a while, even though there's not really a lot of literature related to it. Uh, it's such an interesting lens for looking at the Puritan imagination and the Puritan era that it's, it's hard not to spend a lot of time on it. You'll note that I did provide a timeline uh, it's a good idea to go through that timeline, and I would also suggest you reading at least the first third of the uh, the article that I included on ergotism, which is one of the possible theories explaining um, what happened to the girls and, and why. But it also gives some background on that. And there are also some really good videos, uh, some fairly entertaining videos that I've got you linked to. Um, on YouTube to give you some background as well. But look at the slides, look at the, the timeline. Um, but the things I want you to keep in mind are the uh, sort of the political social context and how the causes uh, for, for what happened and how it happened really spring out of who these people were, the lives that they experienced, the situations that they were in. Uh, thinking back to Mary Rowlandson, right? We have people that are living basically on the frontier, people that are really sort of in fear for their lives a lot of, a lot of the times. And really what's going on during the period of the Salem Witch Trials is, you know, they're just a few decades past that. Um, and so there's a little bit of that still in their mindset, this sort of the, the devil is right outside the door. Um, but when you don't have the devil knocking on your door anymore right away, sometimes you look for other scapegoats and you look for other, other things to point at to, uh, to be able to hold on to power. And um, it's, it's quite possible that... You know, there were people in political power and in spiritual power who jumped on uh, this situation and used it for their gain. So there's a, definitely a political dimension to how large this got uh, and, and, and how the, the hysteria was, was maintained, as well as psychological issues. I mean, you could say that it sprang out of the girl's powerlessness. Uh, it also was reinforced by... The fact that many of the victims were women and women were very powerless in that society and were easy scapegoats. The results, I think, are, are, are quite important to keep in mind. Um, one of the primary results was really this loss of, of trust in authority, uh, specifically in religious authority and in the authority of the, the theocrats and intellectuals who pretty much ran things in uh, Massachusetts Bay, people like Cotton Mather, his father Increase Mather. These are the people who really kind of uh, lost their, uh, their credibility in the wake of these trials being revealed to be really a sham and a, a product of mass hysteria. Uh, and it took a long time for people to come to terms with that. And it really did become um, sort of the the eternal portrait of the, the worst aspects of Puritan New England. You can't think of Puritan New England without thinking of the witch trials. Um, so that was, that was a, a major result as well. Um, politically, I think there was a, a major shift that was going on and that the witch trials definitely influenced, which was the shift. Um, you know, you have a balance of, you know, church and state in the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, with the church, even though the church and state are separate, the church definitely influences the state in that the the people who are in charge of the state that are sort of this, the limited self-government that they have are members of the church. Well, after the witch trials in that time period, you have the royal governorship coming back into the hands of people who are not Puritans. 
And this has, I think, a lot to do with the fact that the people back in England felt that the Puritans were no longer able to handle themselves um, and, you know, saw fit that, well, you know, we need to send someone over there who's not part of this group, that there's too much infighting going on, uh, there's too much stress created by these people trying to govern themselves. And so really the witch trials end up being um, something that leads to their loss of autonomy, their loss of their ability to govern themselves. The uh, first reading that I assigned is is the diary of Samuel Sewell, and I think you'll find it very interesting, uh, very humorous in some places. Uh, His courtship of Madame Winthrop is is pretty hysterical, and you have to read closely uh, to get some of the humor um, but I think I think you'll find that it's 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 pretty interesting. And if you imagine sort of this older gentleman uh, trying to court this this uh, uh, this older lady as well, and trying to convince her to marry him, uh, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Especially the sort of the haggling back and forth and the negotiations that take place. Sewell uh, is significant for a number of reasons. Um, of course, you were assigned to read. Uh, in addition to the diary, the, the selling of Joseph, and that is the first uh, anti-slavery tract published in America. Um, and he was, you know, pretty brave to come out with that. It wasn't an extremely unpopular position, but it wasn't a terribly popular one as well. And you get a little sense of that in the diary uh, because that's one of the possible sticking points between Madame Winthrop and himself is the fact that she is a slaveholder and pay attention to his response to that. Um, but in the Selling of Joseph, he focuses on the fact that uh, he sees slavery as contrary to Christian law and he takes on specific arguments in there that I think are, are pretty interesting. Um, now, the diary itself, like I said, is is really entertaining, and it is the best account we have of Puritan domestic life, and you can see in it the way that social life, economic life has become um, primary above survival, number one, uh, and you know slightly above spiritual life. The last two readings uh, are Cotton Mather and Robert Califf, and the Robert Califf actually includes some Cotton Mather, and it's sort of interesting how that's put together. Um, but to give you a little context for that, Cotton Mather, as I think I've pointed out a couple of times, is is really considered to be sort of the great intellectual mind of that era, of that time, uh, the most prolific author of that time. And the piece that you'll read from him uh, from... Wonders of the Invisible World is a sort of a second-hand account of the a part of the trials of the Salem Witch Trials in this case of, of Martha Carrier, and it's interesting, of course, in the factual elements of you know what was reported about Martha Carrier, but I think it's also interesting to hear Mather's tone and how he describes the people and how he relays their words. We have no way of knowing how much Mather colored what he heard, uh, how much of what he is writing is based on what people actually said. Like I said, it's a second-hand account. He says that he writes, writes this as someone who is reporting rather as rather than someone who's advocating, but there's definitely a position, there's definitely a stance, and the, the strongest part of that stance is that he believes this is real. He does not question this in the least. The Robert Califf introduces a new sort of skepticism, which really sort of brings us into sort of the significance of this week's readings, which is that we start to see a shift between Puritan New England uh, to what we consider Yankee New England. We see a shift uh, in concerns and attitude from a Puritan imagination to uh, sort of a semi-modern imagination. Whereas in the past, they were concerned with the enemy without, with the Indian devils, uh, such as Mary Rowlandson has to deal with. Now they're more concerned with the enemy within. They're looking at one another. Are you a witch? Is she a witch? What's going on? What's going wrong? And in the past, where spirituality was the number one priority, was survival a close second, now that uh, now that, that really survival is taken care of, and now most of the society is prosperous, 
Uh, economic and social concerns are number one, with spirituality a close second. And, of course, another thing that's important about this time period is that events of this period, such as the Salem Witch Trials, become a source for later American literature. <laughs> 